Welcome back into the Morning Rush. Going to the phone lines where we'll welcome in Gary Parrish, host of the Gary Parrish Show, ESPN 92.9 in Memphis, Tennessee, college basketball writer and analyst for CBS Sports. Gary, appreciate you joining us this morning. Justin Smith, you're already under the impression that he's going to start for the Razorbacks this year. Why are you so high on the Indiana transfer? I'll let Moss pick the starting lineup when the time comes. Based on the roster in place, I could certainly see him in the starting lineup, if only because he's a guy who has played real minutes, uh, productive minutes for a nationally relevant Big Ten program. I mean, he was a double-digit scorer last season for a team that was on its way to the NCAA tournament. And so, you know, when you consider he's older, He's experienced. He's obviously gifted. I think he's going to be a a big part of that Arkansas basketball team next season that certainly on paper looks like it will be in the NCAA tournament and perhaps a real challenger to make the Sweet 16 for the first time in a long, long time. If Isaiah Joe does come back to the Razorbacks, do you think it's Sweet 16 or bust? Or is that too of eye of expectation under Eric Musselman in year two? Yeah, I never talk, and I know that a lot of people do, but I never talk about you have to go to a Sweet 16 or it was a bad seat, or you have to go to a Final Four or else it was a failure, because that tournament is an amazing television event, but it is also a single elimination tournament of 40-minute basketball games that can be determined by foul trouble, hot three-point shooting, any number of things. And so it is possible to have an incredible season and then not advance where your roster suggested you should advance in the bracket. The most famous example of that, just two years ago, when Virginia uh, was a one seed, the number one overall seed in the NCAA tournament, and then loses to UMBC in the round of 64. Did Virginia have a bad season? No. Virginia had an amazing season and a terrible final game. What I always say is, I'd rather judge a team over a four-month fan than over a three-week single elimination tournament. So if Isaiah Joe is back, to answer your question, and everybody else enrolls as planned, I would say Arkansas is a preseason top 25 team, and that Arkansas should be about that for the entire season and safely make the NCAA tournament. And then whatever happens in that bracket, happens in that bracket. You also mentioned how quickly Eric Musselman has acquired transfers, and we're speaking with Gary Parrish here on the Morning Rush. Are you surprised in the last two years, whether it's Jimmy Witt, whether it's Justin Smith, whether it's Jalen Tate, Mance Jackson, how quickly he's been able to translate his philosophy from Nevada to Arkansas? No, not at all. I'm a big believer in Musk. I've known him for a long, long time before he even got into college coaching and you know, actually met him through – the Dana and David Pump, the Pump brothers who used to run the Pump and Run uh, teams under the Adidas grassroots banner, uh, Musk was, I think, unemployed at the time, so out of coaching, and was working out some of the Pump and Run teams, um, you know, for Dana and David, so that Dana and David could sell to potential players and their families. We have a former NBA coach working our players out. And so just by coincidence, I happened to be in L.A. back then, and, and Musk was there, and, and we, we hit it off. And, you know, have, I, I've, I've had an incredible level of respect for him uh, ever since. You know, I know his family, terrific people, and I'm not surprised that he's been successful in college coaching and not surprised that he didn't completely abandon the recipe he used at Nevada when he got to Arkansas. Obviously, when you are the head coach at Arkansas, you can recruit at a different level than Mm -hmm. you can recruit at Nevada. And you should be able to recruit differently as well. There's, There's nice high school talent within the state. You should be among the leaders, if not the leader, for every prospect in that state that you want because you're not competing. It's one of the few states where you're not competing with another power conference program within your state. In Mississippi, for instance, if you're Mississippi State, you still got to deal with Ole Miss. In Tennessee, if you're Tennessee, you still got to deal with Memphis and Vanderbilt. In Arkansas, it is, I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know, but Arkansas is the deal. And so you're going to focus heavily on high school prospects, but there's real value to having older, experienced players who are, as far as sit-out transfers go, who are in your program for a year before they ever actually play a game. And I think when I looked at it on paper, Arkansas will have six eligible transfers joining the team next season. And you combine that with four 
top 100 prospect. Again, if you get Isaiah Joe to come back, that's a really nice roster. And it's something I think most coaches would be wise to to maybe consider the value of working the transfer market, even sit out transfers until that rule has changed. Gary, you mentioned the high school talent in the state. One of the other cities that Arkansas, when it's thrived in its basketball program, is the city of Memphis. You're a graduate of Memphis. You've done radio in Memphis for quite some time. You know the basketball talent in the city of Memphis as well as anyone. How difficult is it going to be as long as Penny Hardaway is there as the head coach of Memphis getting high school kids? More difficult than it would be if he weren't there. I will say that it was impossible when he got the job because every kid that they were going to recruit, he had just got through coaching, either at East High School or with Team Penny. You know, as we get further away from those times, we get more into prospects that Penny doesn't have that kind of relationship with. It makes it a little more possible for other programs, Arkansas, Auburn, obviously Kentucky, Duke, North Carolina, to come in and and try to recruit these prospects. But still, you're always going to have to beat Memphis. Under these circumstances, Mm -hmm. with Penny in charge, you're going to have to beat Memphis to get somebody out of Memphis. I will tell you one thing that has changed the dynamics over the past 10, 15, 20 years is that once upon a time, like when Penny was a player, the best high school prospect in Memphis were at city school. They were at Melrose or Treadwell or Hamilton or East High School. And what has happened, and this is a good thing, to be clear, but what has happened over the past 10 to 15 years is that the best basketball prospects in the city get recruited, for lack of a better verb, to the private school. So you have Kennedy Chandler, a five-star point guard at Briarcrest Christian. You had Musa Cisse, a five-star big at Lausanne Collegiate School. So it makes it easier to come in and get the kids after they go to a private school because some parents have been hesitant about sending their, quote, private school kids back to the University of Memphis. I had one parent of a prominent prospect tell me once upon a time, I worked like crazy to get him out of the city, why would I send him right back into the city? And so that's a, just a different dynamic that Penny has to fight against. You know, that once kids get into the suburbs or at least into the better schools on paper, um, they are suddenly candidates to be college students at better academic institutions than the University of Memphis. And so that's something Penny has to, to work against. But still, Penny Hardaway recruiting for the University of Memphis is always going to be a factor with Memphis kids to some degree. Speaking with Gary Parrish, college basketball writer for CBS Sports on the Morning Rush. On that note, we know that within the city limits of Memphis, you can build a Division One basketball program, a prominent Division One basketball program. There was speculation a couple weeks ago when Arkansas had yet to release a prominent non-conference opponent, ended up being Oklahoma and Tulsa these next couple years. Let me sell you on the idea of Arkansas and Memphis renewing that rivalry. Now, it was not going to happen under Cal when he was there, but Cal's long gone. Penny would like to reach into Arkansas, too. You just mentioned the high school talent in this state. What about the idea of Muss and Penny rekindling that Arkansas-Memphis connection and playing every other year? You don't have to sell me on it. I love it. Like you mentioned, I'm a graduate of the University of Memphis. I grew up on Memphis, Arkansas. Like I grew up on Nolan Richardson, you know, more often than not beating the crap out of the Tigers. <laughs> I remember uh, you know, Todd Day and, 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 and you know, Corey Brewer and, and all of those guys. And so I have fond memories of the Memphis-Arkansas rivalry. And I think it's something that's sensible for a couple of different reasons. A, I know that coaches get it in their head for whatever reason that they need to play a quote unquote national schedule, but I'm not really sure how important that is. Arkansas could play Seton Hall, I guess, and that would get them into the New York area and that would qualify as a, as a, as a national opponent. But like, does any Arkansas fan care about beating Seton Hall? I mean, it's just a one of a million non-league games that would show up on ESPN2. And I would say the same thing about Memphis, by the way. But like Arkansas playing Memphis, that matters to people in Arkansas. Memphis playing Arkansas, that matters to people in Memphis. And, and why? It's because if, if you are an Arkansas fan, they're particularly one that lives on the east side of the state, there's a good chance you are friends with or work with a Memphis fan or a Memphis graduate. One of my best friends is an Arkansas grad. 
Uh, my a CPA is an Arkansas grad. It, these games are always more fun when you have a relationship with people who are connected to the other school. How many Arkansas fans know a Seton Hall graduate? How many Arkansas fans, Memphis fans even you know, know what the Seton Hall campus looks like or can name the <laughs> Seton Hall coach? Kevin, so, it's Kevin I'm Willard, right? It is Kevin Willard, okay. the correct answer. Um, but I'm a big believer in like playing games that that play games that your fans want to circle on the calendar. And so I've always thought that, you know, speaking for Memphis specifically, you know, play Ole Miss, play Tennessee, play Arkansas. Those three are the, the, the biggest three, I think, in terms of regionals. And then for Arkansas, I'll let Arkansas fans figure out who that is. But, you know, maybe, but maybe Texas is, is one of them. But, but Memphis is certainly one of them. So it, I think it works on that level. And then the other thing that I think you're going to see more and more often is that because of the pandemic, athletic departments are just going to have not as much money yep. as they used to have. And so it didn't matter before if you wanted to, you know, to get a charter plane and fly your basketball team to California to play one game. Like you got more money than you know what to do with if you're an SEC school. But everybody's budgets are taking a hit right now. And so what I think you might see athletic directors um, – plead with their men's basketball coaches to do is like if there's a bus ride to be had let's take the bus ride and i know it's a long bus ride between Fayetteville and memphis but it is possible you could do it if you wanted to and i think what you'll find is more and more men's basketball teams um saying why do we need to get on a plane when there's a reasonable comparable and and exciting opponent that is much closer to our campus. And, that, then, and so Memphis, Arkansas could maybe fit that criteria as well. Uh, simply put, I, I'm all for it, big believer in it, and I'd love to see Moss and Penny get that thing worked out. Gary, one of the players right now that Penny Hardaway, Eric Mossman, John Calipari would love to have is Cade Cunningham. And we'll talk about the Oklahoma State stuff coming up. But what do you see Cade Cunningham doing with his future on the basketball court? I thought it was interesting after it was announced last Friday that Oklahoma State's going to be banned from the 2021 tournament. Almost immediately, Mike Boynton, the Oklahoma State coach, was on the record saying, I'll help Cade do whatever he wants to do. If he wants to go to another college, I'll work with him on that. If he wants to go to the G League program, I'll work with him on that. In other words, it seemed like Mike was almost acknowledging he's not coming to Oklahoma State under these circumstances. Right, he's gone. And so Kentucky was the other school heavily involved with him throughout the process. And I know Kentucky's roster is now loaded, but Kentucky fans have said, well, you know, we've got A, B, and C. We don't need Kate Cunningham now. It's like, what are you talking? That's like saying you don't need LeBron (laughs) James now. Like it doesn't, like if you can have Giannis on your roster, it doesn't matter who else is on your roster. You'll take him and figure it out. And Kate Cunningham is exactly that guy. I'm, to be clear, I'm not comparing him to LeBron James or Giannis, but for college basketball purposes, he's that guy. I mean, he's the number one prospect in America, projected to be the number one pick in the 2021 NBA draft. And so everybody will make a spot for him if he decides he wants to go there. And then, of course, just training in that G League program is, a, is another option. I guess I'd bottom line it this way. I don't know what he's going to do. The only thing I feel certain saying is that he's not going to go to Oklahoma State because the truth is, to the extent any of these young people still dream about playing college basketball, it is mostly tied to going to the NCAA tournament and competing on that stage. And once that, in early June, has been ripped away from you as an opportunity, it seems, uh, I don't know, illogical to, to go enroll at that school and play what amounts to 30 whatever meaningless basketball games with a path to nowhere available to you. Um, I'd rather, if I were Kate Cunningham, go anywhere else that I felt like I would at least have a chance to play in the NCAA tournament, compete for the national title, and I suspect he'll do that or join that G League program. We're talking college basketball with Gary Parrish, ESPN 2, 92.9 in Memphis here on the Morning Rush. Gary, you've written about it. You've talked about it. Oklahoma State, it seems like it's just going to be the crack door of this FBI investigation If you're a coach right now in college basketball, pick one. Who do you think should be the most scared of what's to come with this investigation? Bill Self, Sean Miller. You know, those. I think the first thing you got to understand is is what Oklahoma State was accused of doing. 
And it really wasn't anything other than it had an assistant coach on staff who accepted about $20,000 in bribes to funnel to funnel student athletes to financial advisors once they decided to leave Oklahoma State. In other words, the allegation was never that um, Lamont Evans, the Oklahoma State assistant, went out and used money to buy a recruit to enhance the Oklahoma State roster. It was merely to influence a business decision after these players left. In other words, Oklahoma State gained no roster advantage whatsoever from what Lamont Evans did. And it led to one level one violation, and still they get a postseason ban. So if that's the starting line, and I should be clear, um, the idea that the NCAA follows precedent is untrue. You know, they've been wildly inconsistent forever about the cases they pursue and, and how they punish people who violate the rules. But if, if you believe that this time is going to be different, and, and I personally do, then Oklahoma State is about the least uh, of, of the notice of allegations that have already been sent. And, we all, we, and, and if you compare it to the allegations we know exist against the Arizona program, they're really not comparable. At Arizona, they are accused of using money to buy recruits. At Kansas, they are accused of using money to buy recruits. So if I were Arizona or Kansas, Bill Self or Sean Miller, I'd be real nervous right now because if what Oklahoma State did got a one-year postseason ban, you got to think Kansas, Arizona, at the very least, are going to get two, maybe even three, including suspensions for their head coaches. And then at Auburn, like the same thing that happened at Oklahoma State happened at Auburn. Like the, it's, it's, it's basically the exact same thing. So you got to think Auburn's headed for a one-year postseason ban. USC, same thing that happened to Oklahoma State happened there. You got to think USC is headed for a one-year postseason ban. South Carolina, same thing that happened to Oklahoma State happened at South Carolina with the same person. You got to think they're headed for a postseason ban. So I've had a lot of fans since I wrote a column last Friday say, I'll believe it when I see it. And I guess I can't argue against that. You, you have historical reasons to be skeptical, but I can just tell you from talking to people who work in Indianapolis, they know that this has to be different. They know they can't let this stuff fly. That's why they hit Oklahoma State the way they hit Oklahoma State. And basically everybody else involved is probably going to get hit hard. Gary, let me top off the interview with this with a food question. I've been through Memphis many a times. I know you're originally from Lake Horn. I've been to Memphis Barbecue Company. I've had Commissary. I've had Central. I've had Rendezvous. I've had a ton of fantastic barbecue places in Memphis. For your money, what's the best one, man? Well, I have to say Memphis Barbecue Company because I have a business relationship with Memphis <laughs> Barbecue Company. And it really is terrific for people who don't know. It is, um, it, it is owned by a woman who is the first woman ever inducted into the Barbecue Hall of Fame, who is a seven-time world champion. So as I say on the air, and this is factually correct, there are a lot of great places in Memphis, in the Memphis area, to get incredible barbecue. Uh, but there's only one place to get world championship barbecue, and that is Memphis Barbecue Company. So let's rephrase the question and say, what is my second favorite uh, barbecue spot in the Memphis area, there and I go. think I would go with Cent- I think I would go with Central Barbecue, um, the, the 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 original location on Central Avenue, not far from Christian Brothers University. Like I've been going there my entire life, and listen, the Rendezvous is great because of the scene, and it's like the food is terrific as well. Like Memphians tend to roll their eyes at the Rendezvous as a tourist place, but that doesn't mean it's not awesome. So I enjoy the Rendezvous, I enjoy the commissary. I enjoy Interstate Barbecue, uh, the barbecue shop. Um, you know, uh, there, there's a you know, uh, I could name fifty really nice places. But my second favorite after Memphis Barbecue Company, probably Central Barbecue. Um, it's it's really it, it's first class and and also like a casual, really laid back environment. So it's 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 nice. I, I, if people are ever in town, um, certainly check it out. It's, you, you won't be disappointed. Gary Parrish, host of the Gary, Gary Parrish Show on ESPN 92.9 in Memphis, also a college basketball writer for CBS Sports. Gary, appreciate you taking some time this morning to join the Morning Rush. My pleasure. Take care, man. Bye.